This has been sitting up here for two days. Somebody must be missing it. What's your name again? Heather. 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 I've asked you that before. You've answered it before. I just want to re remember the name of the person who helped me fix the video not auto-playing when I try to advance the slide in my Google Slides. Heather is now famous for that. All across the internet. Well, to both people that are watching. What are we talking about today? Remember, I know, I'm testing. What's that? No. Additive and subtractive manufacturing. As I like to say, sort of the, the pluses and minuses of manufacturing. I made that up myself. Pun totally intended. Yeah, I may, maybe you're grinning. It's hard to tell with the masks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that. You're all smiling and just, that was pretty fake. That was pretty fake. <laughs> so what do I mean when I say additive and subtractive manufacturing? What's, what, all right, so when I say subtractive manufacturing, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, so the machining processes that we've been focusing on for the entire class. That, that's all subtractive manufacturing. We talked about it at the very, the very beginning. We said we were doing material removal by large chip formation with our CNC machining that we're doing. And so if I say additive manufacturing, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah. 3D printing. 3D printing. Anybody else, anybody have something other than 3D printing be the first thing that comes to mind with additive manufacturing? What are some other things that come to mind with additive manufacturing? Is casting additive manufacturing? I don't think 
anybody typically refers to casting as additive manufacturing. Um, now, if you think about it, though, there's air in the mold and you add the material to it and it forms to a different shape. Um, cast, casting kind of stands alone in its own little thing there. But what else comes to mind with additive manufacturing? Welding. Welding. What else comes to mind with additive manufacturing? Isn't assembly kind of an additive manufacturing process? Yeah. You're adding pieces together to make a whole thing. Now, why do we, why does 3D printing come to mind first for all of us? And for me too, you know, it's not, I'm not picking on you guys. 3D printing is the first thing I think of if you say additive manufacturing. Why is that the thing that comes to our, to the forefront? Why is it the thing we think of first? I have a theory about it. Come on, these guys are doing it. There they go. I'm not going to just talk. I have a theory about why 3D printing is the thing that comes to mind first when we say additive manufacturing. Right? My theory is because we've heard so much about the coolness of 3D printing in the past, I don't know, what, 10 years now? People, people have been putting out TED Talks and there's this about it and everybody's very excited about 3d printing when did we start doing 3d printing anybody know some of the earliest 3d printers as we know them now were uh, were built in the 1980s same similar technology to what we're doing now some of the earliest 3d printers were built in the 1980s that was like 40 years ago but we're just talking about it now what's changed now to make us talk about it more. Yeah. Patents expired and now people can build them uh, cheaper. And Patents expired. It, do you know that for a fact or are you just guessing? Yeah, it was yeah. Stratasys that owned nearly everything. And okay, that makes sense expired. that they owned the patents. Yeah, so, so the technology got released to a wider mass. I don't think that's the only thing that changed though. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was watching a, uh, a 3d printer where they were, where they were printing concrete to build a structure, uh, just, just the other day. Um, it's funny because the video was billed as a robotics video because they were showing how they were using a robot to control the nozzle for the 3d printer. They weren't even, they weren't even talking about the 3d printing fact of it as much as they were the robot being part of it. But, um, so yeah, so technology changed. Patents became available so more people could then play with the technology without having to pay Stratasys big, um, big licensing fees. But, uh, but also, th there was a lot of publicity. What else changed over that same time period? Yeah. They certainly have become much cheaper, right? I mean, you could, I think you could buy a a device called a 3D printer that may or may not print something for less less than forty dollars, maybe even as low as twenty dollars, right now. Oh, they have those little pen things, right? The little pencil things where you can just do it by hand. When I was a kid, we called that a glue gun, and it was a different form factor. So, um, so I think the other thing that changed is this, this rise of the, of the internet, the World Wide Web, and this mass communication. So it wasn't just that the technology got cheaper, but that people were talking about it, right? There was TED Talks. There was all this publicity and hype about 3D printing. You know, you get to, this, you get to see, I guess I have to click play too, right? You get to see the new creation rise up. And that's pretty cool. And it makes for really cool video, right? So 3D printing has become popular because of those things. Well, certainly has become more popular because we've been able to see two guys standing around talking. 
never understood why so many YouTube videos have two guys standing around talking as if they're famous comedians and we want to hear what they have to say. But I guess that's what I'm doing now, huh? <laughs> some of you have to hear what I have. Some of you believe you need to hear what I have to say. So um, I like to do tours. Did any of you guys get to go on a tour at WPI? Did any of you get to go into any of the lab spaces during your tour? So I know if you did tours in the last couple of years, they weren't bringing people inside buildings and they weren't going into labs. You got to? Did you walk through the washburn shops? No? We had the building that's like way over there, and that was quite a lab. Yeah. So, uh, so before all of the COVID craziness, lab groups, lab tours were like a daily thing. There would be groups of prospective students coming into the lab and, uh, and we would talk to them because I guess that's the polite thing to do. And I remember this years ago, this was shortly after I took over the facility. So sometime around 2006, 2007, when, when this hype of 3D printing start, was starting to come out, it was really, people were talking about it a lot then. And uh, in this father of the prospective student sort of pulled me aside because he has the big technical question to ask. And he's like, well, do you guys do any rapid prototyping here? And I knew he meant 3D printing. I knew what he meant. But I said, yeah, we do. And we didn't have any 3D printers. I don't think there was a 3D printer on campus at this time. Maybe there was one in the ME office built or the, uh, at the outside of the design studio. I think there was one. And um, I said, yeah, we, we do rapid prototyping. Because in my mind, half an inch deep, half an inch over, and 800 inches a minute, it's pretty rapid. And that's what we were doing with aluminum that day. Right? So, so our additive manufacturing, we typically think about 3D printing with our Material removal, we'll think about a milling process or a turning process. Typically, those are the first things that come to mind. Why would one be better than the other? Why would one be better than the other? Yeah. You can make something that doesn't have like a, a very obvious grain to it. The way that done. So, if you're trying to make something and it doesn't have an obvious like structure of layer, well, that's because most of the 3D printing software that we use today takes our solid model and cuts it up into layers in order to have us send the code to the 3D printer to tell it how to work. So they they use their CNC machines. Those 3D printers are CNC machines. Many of them use G code in the back end, the same kind of code that our mills and lathes use. So the software that we tend to use to do 3D printing tends to build stuff up in layers. And I think that's because of our limited mental capacity to think that we have to build stuff in layers that way. I think that's one of the reasons. Um, it's just this, the, the way the physics that we've understood so far allows us to do it. So if it doesn't obviously stack up as a bunch of layers, it may not be well suited to 3D printing. What, what do we know about 3D printing? What do we know about additive manufacturing that makes it a better way to make stuff? Yes. Hollow or very like odd, what you thought, um, prismatic shapes um, that you can't simply make. Uh, so you can make hollow shapes you could actually make complex features on the inside of shapes that you couldn't reach with an end mill. So you can make features that you couldn't make without using 3D printing, without this ability to make these hollow inside shapes. Um, oh, here, I got one. Pocket. That's the pocket. So... I've got my um, soda pop bottle opener, and, uh, and it was 3D printed out of titanium. 
and uh, and it's really cool and it's got all these complex shapes in it i don't know if you guys can see the complex shapes i'll pass it around as long as you promise to give it back and don't open any bottles during class it's got a lot of complex shapes in it and uh, and i was really impressed when i saw that i was like hey look you could 3d print this super complex shape and uh, and i showed it to my wife and uh and she said yeah that's pretty cool how many do you want and what material would you like them out of because she's a casting expert and she says we could cast those all day long so 3d printing was a cool way to make that but it didn't have to be 3d printed it could have been cast uh, with a lot of those complex interior shapes that we were making before, we could cast them, but not all of them. There's certainly shapes that you can 3D print that you can't cast. And the reason you can't cast is because you can't get the thing out of the complex area once you're done forming the metal around it. So there's complex shapes that we can 3D print that we can't CNC machine. And... You, you brought up this idea of this layering and this structure. So even if it's not obvious how to layer it and how to do that, often we can figure out how to do it. And so that uh, that little uh, keychain bottle opener thing that I'm passing around there, how long do you think it would take to cast one? So a little part about this big, how long do you think it would take to pour the metal into the mold and then let the metal cool to solidify. Yeah. Seconds to minutes. How long do you think it took to 3D print? Hours. So one of the things about 3D printing is you can get these really complex surfaces. It takes a long time to do a lot of those processes. Now, not all of them. This the, the video where we showed the, showed the fancy shape rising up out of the resin there. The video is speeded up seven times from the actual process speed when they made it. So, so we wanna consider how long does it take to make the material. Now, what are, what are the benefits of doing 3D printing though? Yeah you create much less waste, right? So one of the things you can do with 3D printing is you can make that part just using the material that it takes to make that part. So when we CNC machine something, what percentage of the material do you think we typically remove from the part, from the workpiece? 60, maybe on a two-dimensional plate part, Maybe you're in that range of 40 to 60% material removal. When you're making the, the spars that hold up the parts of the airplane wing, you're doing 98, 99% material removal sometimes. Because you want those to be really light. They have to have structure at the spot to, if you could machine a part like the one we're passing around, it would certainly be about 90% material removal. So if we 3D print it, we don't have all that waste. So one of the reasons we like 3D printing is we don't get all that waste. Now, that's good, but it takes longer. So how do we fix it takes longer? So what if I want to make a thousand of those a day and it takes an hour to make each one? So, right, I buy more printers, line up more printers in a row and I can fix the problem of it takes longer as long as we're not just making one, right? If we're making a thousand a day and it takes a day to make one, if I have a thousand machines, I can make a thousand a day, right? So there are things to overcome. Now, what is a problem? What is the problem you could see with making airplane parts 3D printed? So, several years ago, I, um, I heard that Airbus was putting, I can't remember how many hundred tons of 3D printed parts in their new airplanes every year. So they made this big announcement. What's the problem with putting 3D printed parts in airframes? Yeah. 
it does not have the same microstructure as the machined part. So we've been building these airplanes for years by machining the parts. And we figured out how to keep the airplanes from falling out of the sky. Figured out how to keep the wings from falling off. As soon as we 3D print it, we put the material together differently. And nobody knows how long those 3D printed parts are going to last in a fatigue loading situation where it's vibrating, where it's moving back and forth. So here at WPI in the materials labs, we, I think about 98% of the research that's going on right now is about how long are these 3D printed parts going to last? How are these 3D pr printed parts going to fail? What mechanisms are going to cause them to fail? And so that Airbus thing with all those hundreds of tons of parts going in their aircraft every year, it was the latches for the overhead bins. That was what they were 3D printing. The part of the latch handle for the, 3D, for the overhead bins. They weren't 3D printing little parts that go inside the engines yet. Now, SpaceX 3D prints parts that go in their rocket motors. So you can do it. But you've got, to, you've got to understand it. So part of the problem with the 3D printed parts is we don't understand how they're going to perform long term. Uh, and we've been doing material removal by chip formation since the first person picked up a chisel and hit a rock with it, right? So we've got a good understanding of material removal by chip formation. So that's some of the differences, the, some of the problems we see going into this new 3D printed technology. Now, what, the, what's the other thing besides not knowing the material, the internal structure of the parts? What else is different about these 3D printed parts from our machine parts? You guys all had a chance to, uh, to hold this in your hand, right? So this is as it came out of the print. Well, I guess it's had some secondary processes happen to it right here where it grips onto the um, top of the bottle. It's got a little bit of wear there and it's got some wear from being in my pocket and rubbing against keys. But um, what do you notice about this compared to a machined part? Anything that was stood out to you as you looked at it? What about the surface texture? Was it kind of unique? Yeah. And so that's the surface texture that this particular powder laser centered yeah, that's hard to get back together it's laser centered so they they get this bed of powder and they uh they focus a laser beam on that and melts the bits of powder to each other and then i think the table goes down comes up or they put some more powder in then they focus the laser i'm not sure exactly how this one works um but they build it up layer by layer like you said by melting the layers together with the laser. And this is the surface texture that gets left behind with that process. Now, when we were, um, if we're talking about that fatigue loading, if we're talking about that fatigue loading, if we think about the surface of our part. Now, when we're uh, making, let's, let's stick with airplane parts because I don't think the wings falling off the airplanes is going to be a good thing. Uh, when we're when we're typically making these parts with CNC machining, doing our 98% material removal, we leave behind these surfaces like this, right? So we leave behind surfaces like that. If we look at this surface, if we zoom in on it, we'll see that it looks more like this. And, and also this one, as it comes out of the printer, is rougher. So the amplitude, the height of these things is probably bigger on this one also. So this surface, where do fatigue cracks start? Yeah. It's stress concentrations, which tend to happen at the bottom of valleys. So a stress cut, and so this surface doesn't have a lot of deep valleys in it, does it? With this surface, has all kinds of different valleys in it. 
So this one is possibly more likely to have those kind of fatigue cracks. How do we fix it? So say we've got the microstructure figured out. See, the fact that this bulk material down here was created by melting bits of powder to each other. We don't care about that. We've figured that part out. How do we fix this? How do we fix that problem? Yeah. We apply some kind of finish, like finish machining it, and then make it look like this. And so those 3D printed parts are very good at making near net shape parts. So parts that are close to the thing we want, but not yet finished. And so we do this finished machining. So there's um, machine tool makers now that make like milling machines like we're using next door, except in the milling machine, they have a 3D printer also. And so they'll 3D print the material and then go finish machine it without taking out of the fixture. So those are pretty cool setups. So we can use additive manufacturing to eliminate waste. There are ways to get around the problems that we have. The way we're fixing the bulk material problems is we're just studying it. We're figuring out what we need to do. Can you heat treat it after you 3D print it? Does that, can you still change it and make it the way you want it to be? So this works. Those machines, the, the ones that have the 3D printers and the uh, CNC five axis machining set up, all that stuff inside, those tend to be expensive today. But just like everything else, that's gonna come down in cost. Those are gonna get easier to use. So additive and subtractive manufacturing are gonna be working together as we move forward. So I, it, there was, a, there was a time when NSF was funding um, a lot of 3D printing research. And so that means at that time, 3D printing was advanced manufacturing, right? Because we talked about advanced manufacturing is whatever the government's funding right now. So the truly advanced manufacturing is, is what are we doing to get better parts to our customers? And it's going to be a joining of this additive and subtractive manufacturing in the same machines that are going to be that future machine tool that we're going to see out there. Additive and subtractive manufacturing. Anybody else have anything to say on this topic? Yeah. Um, so you 3D print the 3D print the part. So if this is the finished shape of the part, you would 3D print it a little bit bigger and then come in and machine away the extra. And so that'll help you if the surface finish is your problem. It won't help you if the bulk material properties are your problem. But um, the way we fix the bulk material properties is just to, to study it, to learn more about it. To um, And one of the really nice things about these 3D printing ways is you can actually make custom alloys where you can mix different metals together as you're doing that melt. And it doesn't have to be the whole part. It could just be the part where you needed extra strength. So you do special things at certain parts of the part. Uh, the other thing that where additive manufacturing is used a lot and it doesn't get a lot of press and it's really where we started doing additive manufacturing is repairing worn out parts and so you'll see a lot so i was at a um, i was in a meeting and we we're just breaking for lunch the guys that were going to talk next had put their slides up before lunch came and then everybody went and got a sandwich we all sit in the meeting room eat our sandwiches and chat about our kids and stuff and then the meeting starts back up and so as we're sitting there having lunch, I'm looking at the slides and, um, and it just says B1B transmission. And there's a picture of a piece of metal and they're talking about, they're going to talk about repairing this B1B transmission. And I figured it's a part number for something. And we get up there and he starts this presentation. You know, it's actually a picture of the power transmission for a B1 bomber, B1B. And they said during the presentation that 
100% of the B-1 bombers that were still in service were flying with repaired transmissions. It wasn't possible to build a new transmission anymore. They, did, they had lost the ability to have a certified vendor who could build one of these transmission housings. So all of them had been repaired. And the way they repaired it was by sitting it on the table, firing up a welder, and filling in the holes where it got worn out. So there'd be a place where a bearing comes out. So there's a bearing and a shaft through it. And as vibrations happen, that hole where the bearing is will widen out. Finally, it's too big to hold the bearing in place. And so at that point, they would fill that in with weld, put it in a milling machine, put a new hole in, push a bearing in. And so we use these 3D printing tools to do that kind of repair all the time. It happens at your auto repair shop. They'll weld in a hole and then drill it back out to make it the right size. So that's a, another common use of this additive manufacturing tool, which we've been doing forever, for as long as we've been able to weld. The welder is kind of the undo button for the milling machine. Um, So let's just talk about the rest of the term, the things we have left to do. So if you're watching from home, that's the last, well, unless people ask questions about additive manufacturing, but I do want to talk about the, the things that are left to do for the term. So I, I told you I'd give you the, the practice final exam and the final exam. I'm going to make both of those live tonight at the same time. Do the practice one until you feel comfortable and you have unlimited attempts on this practice one. If you're struggling with questions, you can post in the discussion forum or you could come find me and ask me. I'll be in the lab all day today, all day tomorrow, and then all next week during the normal time. So to put that out there, obviously we haven't had the last lecture yet. Last lecture is scheduled for next Tuesday. There may be some, there, there will be at least one question that pertains to that last lecture. So before you're done, wait until after we have that last lecture. I will come in on Wednesday to answer questions. Anybody has questions still working on the exam? When did I say the project was due? Tomorrow. So the uh, do it by tomorrow. If you can't. The deadline is flexible. So uh, it's the, the only reason I have due dates on any of my assignments that I ever give is because the PLAs yelled at me and said, I have to have due dates. Because if I don't give you guys due dates, some of you will wait until the last day of the term and try to do everything. And that never works. So the reason for the due dates and the reason for the late policy even is so that you have some a goal, you have a deadline to get to. So if you need more time, take more time to, to, uh, to get that done. But don't take any more time, just do it. Hand it in. The best paper is the one that you've already handed in. I truly believe that because you don't have to work on it anymore. The best thing about deadlines is once they arrive, you're ready. So, um, so we get the practice quiz, the practice exam, the exam. You guys have been going through your lab practical exam. I think most of you have had a chance to do it by now. Uh, again, that was that is intended to see: can you safely operate the machine tool? And as long as you know that you don't know how to do something, you can safely operate the machine tool. As long as you stop when you get to the edge of your knowledge. Um, if you did have a problem with the exam and want to take it again, you can schedule a time to come in and take it on Friday. Um, or you could do it during lab next week at the beginning of the week. And uh, next week, we're going to be assembling our Sterling engines in lab. Um, what else is missing? Can you say due date by tomorrow at the end of the project or the exam? The project. No. I asked when it was due because I couldn't remember off the top of my head. Somebody said tomorrow. Which sounds, really? Tomorrow? 
Tomorrow's a Friday. I made a Friday be a due date this term. I didn't, I didn't intend to have any Friday due dates this term before I do it by Friday. Don't do it over the weekend. It'll ruin your whole weekend. When I was, um, I, I used to hate it when the professors would, would actually, I used to hate it when the professors would give us extra time to hand stuff in, especially at the end of the term. They say, oh, well, you know, tomorrow's the end of the term, but you can hand it in the day after. That'll be okay. Because I was the idiot that always took the extra time. And then I'd be sitting in my room trying to do that final paper while everybody else in the house behind me was having a party because school was over. And so that's no fun. So don't wreck your weekend. Do it by Friday. But if you need the weekend, that's okay. Uh, what else? What else? Do we miss anything else? All right. I had a lot of fun being here with you guys this, this term. Thank you for so much of you showing up today. This must be like half almost. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fourteen. 10, 11, 14. We get 14 over here. It's almost half. I'm assuming this same density distribution on both sides of the room and seven people online. I think we hit 50%. Pretty excited. What else? What other classes are you guys taking? I'm going to go ahead and stop the, stop the live here. <laughs>